So as you know, here in the Kennedy Center, every semester we have a certain theme that unifies our academic events, our lectures, and so on throughout the semester. And this semester, our theme is the new international disorder, right? Order, disorder. Uh, try to give the sense that, you know, maybe you can consider it in both ways. Uh, one of these brochures is right on the table, right there at the entrance. So if you're... Uh, if you're curious about the other lectures in the series, right, you can find all find out all about them here. And um, anyway, we have a lot of events during the course of the semester, and we just encourage you uh, to check them out. You can check out our website, follow us uh, on Facebook and Instagram, and be kept abreast of our uh, events. Uh, but as I've said, we're very excited uh, this semester for this lecture series, and we think it's really timely. And we're particularly grateful that the, the first lecture in this series is by Dr. Kerry Karchner, and we'll be hearing a little bit more about him uh, soon. Uh, my name is Stan Benfell. I'm the director of the Kennedy Center, and uh, we're just really excited uh, to have you here. Um, what we'll do is we'll begin, as is our custom at BYU, with an opening prayer that will be offered by Greg Hook, uh, who's from Highland, Utah, and majors in cell biology and physiology. And following the opening prayer, uh, Chad Nelson, who is faculty in our political science department, will introduce our speaker. So, Greg. Dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this opportunity to increase our knowledge and to learn um, more about the history of our world and to come closer to Jesus Christ. We're grateful for Dr. Karchner and his time today. Please bless him and help us all to learn and grow. And uh, please bless those that are struggling at this time with the pandemic, that they may receive the health and healing that they need. And please bless this university. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Professor Karch, Kerry Karchner is a retired State Department employee where he works on uh, he worked on issues of in, involving arms control and uh, nuclear uh, nonproliferation. Among many other things, he was the senior advisor for the missile defense policy, and he convinced the Japanese of the virtues of the, their uh, missile defense system. Uh, beyond being a practitioner, uh, Dr. Karchner is also a scholar. He got his PhD at the uh, University of Southern California, and his publications include a co-edited volume on uh, limited nuclear war and a co-edited volume on strategic culture. And finally, he's a teacher. Uh, he has taught at places such as Johns Hopkins University and tech, the Bush School at Texas A&M, and also right here. Uh, he's taught uh, courses at BYU, uh, including... Um, uh, international ethics, uh, nuclear non uh, nuclear proliferation, American uh, um, nu nuclear policy, and then American foreign policy. And in fact, I want to bring that up, especially because he's teaching a class on nuclear uh, policy next semester. And I happen to know he's a great professor. So if any of you are interested, uh, look at the f look at the winter schedule that will be popping up shortly. And so we're very happy to have him here, uh, Professor Karshner. Thanks, Chad, and, and thanks, Ben, for that welcome and the introduction. I, as I was preparing the material for this presentation, it occurred to me how overwhelming all this data is. This is a very complex subject, and so I'm going to try to reduce a, a tremendous amount of information down to some things that can, we can talk about that, that are a little more digestible. And so I'm going to start. This is my effort to make this more digestible. I'm going to tell you what the main conclusions are up front. Um, there, there are two main points that I hope come out of what I have to say and then that we can discuss in the Q&A period. And that is, both the US and Russia are actively modernizing their existing nuclear weapons. 
Uh, Russia is testing and deploying a new generation of nuclear delivery vehicles right now as we speak. And the U.S., on the other hand, is at least a decade away from deploying uh, new ICBMs and SLBMs. So one of my bottom line conclusions here that I hope comes out in, in the presentation that I have to make and the information that I have to share with you is that the U.S. may at this time lack the leverage to engage Russia in a major new arms reduction agreement and that that may not be, we may not have sufficient leverage until at least the late 2020s, which is well beyond the expiration date of the new start, which was extended to February 2026. And then a, the question that you all will have to answer uh, is, does this matter? And the reason I say that you all will have to answer this is because I believe that many of these issues will be for your generation to resolve as you assume leadership's positions in American foreign policy and international relations and the Defense Department, the State Department, and so on. So this is what you will need to know. I'm just going to give a little bit of background on the U.S.-Russian nuclear arms competition and where we stand in terms of arms control. I just have a few lessons learned. I spent 10 years negotiating with the Russians on arms control issues. Uh, as both the uh, senior State Department representative for the START Treaty, the first START Treaty, and for the ABM Treaty. And I subsequently spent 10 years working with the Russians, the Chinese, and others in track two engagements on arms. So I've actually had long personal conversations with Russian arms control experts about what Russia's priorities are, what Russia wants to get at, what, what Russia's issues are with U.S. missile defense. I spent much of my career in, involved in that conversation. Uh, but I've also had these conversations with Chinese military and foreign policy officials and experts discussing what their views were on arms control and what their views were on, on missile defense. So I've accumulated some lessons learned from, from that experience. I'll talk about where we are today in terms of what the New START Treaty, which is the, the treaty that President Biden just uh, in, in uh, January extended for five years. And then I'll look at US nuclear force modernization, what are we doing? And I'll look at Russian nuclear force modernization, what, what are the Russians doing? And then let's look at what are the challenges and options are for, for future. Uh, so this is a really handy graph that was put together by Hans Christensen and Matt Korda, uh, working with the Arms Control Association and um, Hans Christensen is uh, somebody that I've gotten to know really well. And he and I have discussed the trends in the nuclear uh, competition between the US and Russia. And we agree on, on the facts of those trends. He and I differ on some of the policy implications of that. But he is the most reliable non-governmental source for information on nuclear stuff. So let me, let me just point out a few things here. Um, how did we make the, there we go. Okay, first of all, here in the early 50s, you know, the US maintained an overwhelming superiority in nuclear weapons. That superiority kind of faded out by the mid-1970s, and in 1977, the Soviet Union achieved a parity with the United States in numbers of nuclear warheads. At, in 1968, the US began tapering off and never, never quite came back. However, the Soviet Union continued building up until Gorbachev came into power and kind of ramped things down. So that, that 1987 peak is, is the, the, the prime of the Soviet nuclear force and began tapering off after that. We signed the INF Treaty in 1987 that eliminated all immediate, intermediate range nuclear forces. We signed the START-1 Treaty in 1992 that, that implemented a 50% reduction from the Cold War highs. And then in 2011, we signed the 10-year-long New START Treaty, which would have expired in February of this year, but was extended by President Biden and uh, Russian President Putin. So here's just a few lessons learned. 
The first one is arms control cannot be divorced from politics, meaning if the US and Russia have a very hostile relationship, it becomes very difficult to, to reach agreement on arms control. But if they have a close, constructive relationship, if they have joint interests, a common basis for, for finding common ground, then, they, then it's more likely that they can do. Arms control is not an end in itself, it's a means to an end, and it's an instrument of US national security. So. I have been involved in negotiations where we were negotiating an, an agreement with the Russians on implementing some arms control. And um, it wasn't always something that was in US interest. And so in my interactions with the, the, my colleagues in the State Department and the Defense Department, I would always press them to, to say, is this really in US national interest to do this? Okay, so that's an important consideration and it doesn't always hold in actual policymaking. Uh, number three, arms control agreements will reflect the reality of existing the existing strategic balance. So if one side has a vast superiority over the other, that's the kind of arms control agreement you'll get. The US, and finally, the, this lesson I think is really important and you'll see this as a theme throughout here. The US must have the leverage necessary to interest Russia in effective arms control agreements. If we have nothing to bring to the table, the Russians have no, very little incentive to actually grant us an effective equitable arms control agreement. So let's just keep those things in mind. Okay, so where are we today? The New START Treaty uh, was signed uh, under President Obama on April 8th, 2010. It entered into force a year later after Senate uh, consent to its ratification. It had been set to expire on February 4th of this year, but it was extended, as I said, for five years. These are its limits. The two numbers that are most important are the 1,550 deployed warheads. And notice I said deployed warheads. So that's not all warheads. That's just the ones that are on the operational weapon systems. The ones that are in storage, the ones that are in dismantlement phases don't count against this. That's why when you see overall numbers of warheads, it's going to be different from the deployed warhead. <laughs> Within that 1,550 deployed warheads, this, the New START Treaty actually allows both sides to structure those forces as, as flexibly as they want. So, uh, New START got rid of the START Treaty's limits on heavy ICBMs, which are those that carry 10 warheads or more, and it got rid of the MIRVED ICBMs, that, those ICBMs that, that carry multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles. And then the most important limit is 700 launchers, deployed ICBMs, deployed SLBMs, and deployed heavy bombers. So no site can have more than 700 of those. Um, here's what the U.S. is doing. Okay, this is just a snapshot overview of what our current force structure is. 400 ICBM launchers, 240 SLBMs on 14 submarines, 60 bombers uh, committed to the nuclear mission. And here's the number of warheads. So, so our number of launchers is 700, which is the, actually lines up really well with the, the START treaties numbers, and our warhead, deployed warheads is 1580. So what's the problem with that number? What are we allowed? Uh -oh, the U.S. is not in compliance with the New START Treaty. This is Kahn's Christensen's estimate, and the reason he has that bumped up is because we refurbished the submarine and put new uh, additional warheads on that. The U.S. declared numbers are, are within the treaty. Uh, we got about 2,050 uh, non-deployed warheads, total number of warheads, uh, strategic nuclear warheads, about 3,570, of which seven, uh, and an additional 1,750 warheads retired awaiting dismantlement. The U.S. can only dismantle between two and 300 warheads a year at a single facility in Pantex, Florida. So that, that's why they're on the right. So here's what the US is doing in terms of modernizing its forces. For the ICBMs, uh, the Minuteman III missiles, which were built in the 60s and 70s, have been that their service life has been extended a couple of times. 
Um, the U.S. Is now ha has a new ICBM in development, the first one since the 1980s. Um, it's planned to be deployed in 2029, but it will not use new nuclear warheads. Instead, it will use upgraded uh, existing weapons. The, the last U.S. nuclear weapon was produced in 1991. All requests for newly designed nuclear warheads that have been made by the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy have been rejected by Congress for, for several different reasons. Um, the sea launched leg of the triad uh, is currently based on the D-5 submarine launch ballistic missile and it is undergoing a, a, a service life extension that will reportedly extend its service life to 2084. I don't expect to be there. Uh, some of you or your grandchildren may be there when, when that finally, uh, the same with the, by the way, the B-52 bomber is, uh, is that reportedly they're extending its service life well into the late uh, 2080s. So it'll be 160 years old when it finally gets retired. How many of you would get on a, a major airline, airplane that was 160 years old? Okay, how many of you are driving a car that's 160? <laughs> uh, the new Columbia class strategic nuclear submarines are, are being developed. Their initial operational capability is supposed to be 2027, first operational patrol in 2031. So again, you know, about 10 years out for a new submarine. The Air Force is producing a, a new long-range bomber known as the B-21, and it's actually almost ready to be deployed. So that's one area where we're like ahead, ahead of the game. But again, no new nuclear weapons for it. Instead, the casings for this new bomber uh, will be upgraded and improved, but the actual weapons package will be one that was manufactured in the 1990s. Uh, in fact, the late 1980s, actually. Um, and, and the Air Force is developing a new cruise missile. Again, the casing, the, the body, the structure of this cruise missile will be brand new and will incorporate all kinds of uh, new improvements. But again, the, the weapon package inside that is it will be a one that is, was originally built in the 1980s. No new nuclear weapon. Okay, this is what the new bomber looks like, uh, the B-21. It's actually quite a bit smaller than the existing B-2, uh, but apparently more stealthy and longer range. I, no, I'm not entirely sure what the, and it only carries half the warhead package, so not sure. So U.S. Last, last nuclear weapon was produced in 1991. The last test in the field of a U.S. nuclear weapon was in 23 September 1992. Um, the U.S. is developing a new ICBM for deployment in the 2030s and new nuclear submarine for deployment in, in 10 years. And the U.S. is deploying a new B-21 bomber. So that's kind of where we stand in terms of what we're doing. Let's take a look at the Russians, what they're doing. Okay, these are the Russian numbers, and there's a couple of things that are very interesting about this. The first one is, you'll notice their number of, of total launchers is 554, which is way below what they're allowed to have. What's going on there? Here's what's going on. Russia is deploying a family of new ballistic missiles that all carry multiple warheads. So whereas in the 90s and the 2000s, we encouraged the Russians to follow our lead into going to fewer warheads on each missile down to one on one, one warhead per missile. But the Russians have never been comfortable with that and have preferred fewer missiles with more warheads on it. So we call that putting more eggs in a, any given basket. And it has serious, uh, strategic stability ramifications. Uh, the Russians' total inventory is quite a bit, of warheads is quite a bit more than ours. But let's take a look at, so 
In 2017, President Putin very publicly announced that, the, that Russia was deploying a whole new family of new nuclear weapon systems um, that were vastly superior to anything that the US had and that could defeat US missile defenses and, and that would be terrifying in their destructiveness. I mean, it was very public about that. We call that saber rattling. So um, it was clear that, that Russia was trying to make a, a to, to state a message with that. So here's a little bit more about each of those five new systems. The Burov Vesnik is a new ground launched nuclear cruise missile. Um, however, it has failed nearly a dozen times and explosions of test missiles have killed many of the top scientists working on the program. So that, I'm sure that does not figure prominently in their personnel recruitment <laughs> brochure, which is, you know, um, come, come and enjoy an exciting career working for the Russian missile complex. And yes, there is a slight danger that your missile will blow up and kill you. But um, we, some experts in the US believe the program has been put on indefinite pause for, for the time. The avant-garde new nuclear-armed hypersonic glide vehicle, which is a warhead that will be put on top of a, so it's this right here is a, going to be a new nuclear-armed warhead that will act like a cruise missile, actually, when it comes down at hypersonic speeds. The Kinjal, a new long-range, dual-capable air-launched ballistic missile for deployment on Air Force interceptors. They're building a new Sarmat ICBM, which will begin replacing the SS-18 with 10 warheads. Um, they're, they're also building a new type of weapon system that no one has ever seen before. It's a long-range, nuclear-powered, nuclear-armed torpedo. And it's the size of a small submarine. And it's supposed to be able to be launched from the, from near Russian territorial waters and travel across the ocean at very deep depths and attack US coastal targets. And Russians have suggested that it's intended to create tidal waves. And what's baffling to us about this is, is that, that makes it strictly a terror weapon. It's not actually one designed to fight a war or, or to, to gain escalation dominance or, or any of those things. So it's very baffling. And this program also has been uh, plagued by lots of programs, uh, lots of problems uh, and uh, exploding and uh, loss of some of the test vehicles. So let's wrap this discussion up about what the Russians are doing by saying we actually don't know a lot about Russia's nuclear weapons modernization efforts. So when you read Hans Christensen's description of the Russian program, it's a lot less detailed than the US, his description of the US program. We know five major new nuclear weapon systems are in development. We've observed them in various stages of development and deployment. We know Russia is actively building new strategic launchers to replace older generations of weapon systems. And we, we, we suspect Russia has two nuclear warhead production facilities. We understand that Russia's, the, the planned lifespan of a Russian nuclear warhead is 10 years, and that they're deployed only for three years, and then they go into a refurbishment cycle. So to do that, to sustain that kind of turnover with such a large, inventory of nuclear warheads, they have to have uh, a vast infrastructure of production facilities to, to do that. Um, and and we, we suspect that while we're restrained in developing new nuclear weapons, they have been developing new generations of, of nuclear weapons. Here's just a little more on the production capacities. This is from an Arms Control Association uh, analysis that said the U if the U.S. ramped up the one facility that it has, it could have the potential to produce 4,000 warheads per year. I think that's wildly exaggerated. 
Okay, right now that facility can only dismantle 200 to 300 warheads per year. So I, I don't know how they could, but that's, an, that's one of the few estimates in the, in the open literature. That same source says the Russians are currently performing an estimated 14,000 warhead operations per year, including 8,000 full warhead assemblies or disassemblies. So this is just painting this picture of a disparity at, in some aspects of the US-Russia competition. Okay. These are some caveats from Kristen and Corda, which I think are important to keep in mind, and that's Russia's constrained by a financial crisis. Um, as I like to point out, Russia's economy is the size of Texas's economy. So Texas has the same gross domestic product that, that Russia has. So it's like the United States competing with uh, a, a very small country in terms of their capacities. Um, but they have significant challenges to overcome, including uh, delays in production of several major weapon systems and cancellation of some programs and delays in their strategic bomber replacement programs. So I don't want to paint a picture of the Russians as uh, indomitable and you know, overwhelming. They, they, they've had serious problems. But I think it's interesting that their president is so publicly about announcing these nuclear weapon programs, and then they run into trouble in, in their production. So, OK. So given the situation with where we are and where the Russians are in terms of new, uh, what our current existing force levels are, and where we're, we're going in terms of modernization, what are some issues that we need to think about in terms of, uh, of uh, negotiating a new arms control agreement with Russia. Here's some questions we need to ask. What limit on warheads should the US or Russia try to establish in a future arms control agreement? Okay, the Obama administration actually had an internal document that called for reaching 1,000 warheads. They never actually got down to that point. Uh, they got down to 1,550. But I would expect that a 1,000 warhead limit is, is, would be a goal for any Biden administration negotiators that, that engage the Russians, um, possibly lower limits. Um, there are serious programmatic deterrence, stability, and verification issues associated with going down to such low numbers. Uh, but there are some really good minds at work on those problems. Should we establish a warhead elimination transparency regime? OK, so this is a, this is a key question that, that is being addressed in the academic arms control literature. And it's driven by the issue that when you get down to just a few hundred warheads each, if one side or the other cheats, it will be really significant. If you, if you had 10,000 warheads each, and one side cheated with 100 or 200 warheads over the limit, that's no big deal. But if your total limit is down below 1,000 warheads, and then the other side cheats with a few hundred warheads, I mean, do you see that it's a proportionality thing? So that's why we are focusing on if we go much lower than the current New START Treaty, we are going to have to have a very robust and intrusive warhead production and elimination verification regime. Uh, when and how should we include China in future arms control re regimes? And, and like I said, I've had long conversations in, in personally with the Chinese and with the Russians on this. And I, I'm aware of what the Biden administration and the previous Trump administration's aspirations for, were for. But the Chinese have no interest in joining the US and Russia in any arms control agreement until they, we get down to what they claim is their level of three to 400 warheads. If Russia and, and, the, U, and the US can get down that low, then the Chinese would consider joining it. The, the Russians actually are not very enthusiastic about engaging the Chinese in this anyways. They, they don't want to elevate China's status to co-equal status with the two great superpowers. You know, so Russia has disincentives against including China. How to manage the verification challenges. I, I talked a little bit about that. 
how to maintain deterrence and stability at low numbers of strategic nuclear words. If you have, so here's a rule of thumb for targeting, nuclear targeting. Only about a third of your totally deployed warheads would ever actually be launched in, a, in an attack. So if you have 1,550 warheads, only about 500 of those warheads would actually be Launch And then how many would be degraded, how many would fail in flight, and by the time you actually get to calculations about how many warheads are actually re reaching designated uh, uh, um, target points, it's a small fraction of what you started out with or that you had to begin with. So how do you maintain, if you've got warhead, a warhead structure that allows you to target, say, maybe 100 targets on the other side, do you, and, and since the, since the 1970s, our targeting has been mostly counterforce, meaning we target military targets. We don't target populations. But if we got down to low numbers, like one or 200 warheads, would we have to consider reverting back to a counter city targeting? Um, so those are some important questions. Let's see what else we got. Okay, the Russians say they won't go any lower until we resolve our missile defense program. The Russians have said that our missile defense program is the, the major hurdle to further reductions in nuclear weapons. Interestingly enough, the Obama administration said a robust missile defense capability, by which they meant mostly meant a regional missile defense capability, was actually a precondition to agreeing to lower numbers of, of offensive nuclear weapons because it needed to be a hedge or a safeguard against a breakout or against a regional threat emerging. So what would the Russians trade for limits on US missile defenses? What would the US give up to keep missile defenses? This is going to be one of the, the most difficult issues to resolve. Um, what about nuclear warheads that are not on strategic or intercontinental delivery vehicles. Um, at one time, we estimated Russia had maybe 4,000 such weapons. Um, the most recent estimate I saw from Hans Christensen was 2,000. Uh, but th there's a lot of unknowns in that number. And the US has maybe between 280 and 400. So can you see what the problem is there? Let's say you're meeting around a negotiating table in Geneva, Switzerland, and you're trading with marbles. And you know, like many of us did in, in playgrounds at school when we were young, we traded marbles. Okay, uh, that maybe dates me. Uh, that's pre-electrons. Um, so what would a negotiating partner said if you came to the table and you said, I, I, want, to, I want you to give me 4,000 of your marbles, and in return, I'm going to give you 400 of my marbles. I mean, isn't there a basic negotiating asymmetry involved there? Unless those were really special, those 400 marbles were really special in some way, you know? Okay. Um, how to capture tactical nuclear weapons. Should we revive the INF treaty that the Trump administration withdrew from? Uh, should we include sea-launched cruise missiles, which have been excluded from these in the, in the past? So <clears throat> a lot of presentations on these arms control challenges and a lot of publications by non NGOs and think tanks end at that point. But I'm going to take this conversation a step further by look, saying, what are Russia's arms control priorities? And, and Having spent near, most of my career in negotiations with Russia or, or in some aspect of public diplomacy related to that, I, I, and then having taught arms control at, at universities and, and published a book on arms control, I've got a good sense of what the Russians' priorities are. And every time we go into negotiation with Russia, they bring up the same issues, so it's pretty consistent, which means we can reliably predict what the Russians are going to raise as issues in a new arms control negotiation. And the first one is they are going to say they need, want to resurrect some form of the ABM treaty which limited missile defenses. So missile defense will have to be on the table. The Russians have always 
started every negotiation by saying that British and French nuclear weapons should be counted in the US total. Does that sound fair? If you're the Russians, it looks fair because those, those are all nuclear weapons aimed at you, technically, theoretically. Um, th the Russians are going to want to keep a freedom to deploy heavy ICBMs. They're going to want to keep freedom to deploy MIRV ICBMs. They're going to want to protect their advantage in numbers of, of sub-strategic or non-strategic nuclear warheads. Um, they're going to wa want to revise the definition of strategic to include all these other things, that, including capturing uh, future US prompt global strike systems, which would be conventional warheads, but with uh, strategic applications. They're going to want to exclude China, and they're going to want to assure Russian nuclear escalation dominance in Europe, meaning they are going to want a superiority of weapons in uh, the European theater. And they are going to resist more intrusive warhead storage and production and inspection because we have a small nuclear weapon infrastructure. They have a vast one. So it, the, the burden of inspections would fall disproportionately on Russia. So here's our challenges. How to respond to Russia's likely priorities in negotiating a follow-on treaty to new, new start? Uh, not just what our US priorities, but how, how are we going to respond to and counter the Russian ones? Okay, and what leverage will the US be able to bring to bear given the long-range pace of our nuclear modernization programs and the disparities with much of what Russia is doing? Okay, I, that may be a lot of information, but and I'm hoping now to have, I, I, I realize I've probably raised more questions than we could possibly answer. But let's, let's have a conversation. And uh, Ben, how would you like to proceed with this? Yeah, so thank you very much. First of all, give. Okay, what we're going to try to do uh, this time is we have a ceiling microphone now installed here. So before we had you line up over here, but here we're just going to have you, why don't you raise your hand. Dr. Carson can call on you. Please, when you stand up, give us your name, what you're studying, uh, just to give a little bit of context, and then ask your question. Okay, so please. Yeah, in the back there, please. in developing new nuclear weapons. Well, Russia has been developing a vast um, nuclear infrastructure, you said. And is that because we are adhering to the new START conditions more closely than they are, or what, what's going on there? No, that's a good question. And the, the congressional reluctance to approve new nuclear weapons predates the new START treaty and goes back to at least 20 years uh, now. So in one aspect of my State Department career, I was involved in helping the State Department and the Defense Department make a case to Congress for a new warhead that we called the Reliable Replacement Warhead, which would have included new modern safety mechanisms, better, better security, uh, and better communications and more reliability and safety for the, the people that were maintaining the warhead because the old warheads have a lot of toxicity related to them, so they're actually difficult to handle. And, and I co-authored a, a report to Congress signed by both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, one of the rare instances where those two signed the same document together. Um, to Congress making the case for, for deploying a, a, a new reliable replacement warhead. And the Congress, the, the Water and Resources Subcommittee of some congressional committee rejected it. And when I engaged with congressional aides about it, uh, this was during the, the Bush administration, the younger Bush administration, they made the argument that we don't want to give the administration a more usable nuclear weapon 
for fear that they would use it, that they would have more, it would be easier for them to use it, okay? That's the argument that they make when there is a Republican in office. When a Democrat is in office, they, the reason Congress rejects it is because it would be inconsistent with our nonproliferation goals, which is to reduce reliance on nuclear weapons, reduce the numbers. So building a new one makes it look like we're abandoning those priorities. Is this responsive to your question? I mean, there's political arguments for that. Right, right. Our, our democratic process for getting approval is subject to these kinds of politics. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Alex Mumford. I'm a physics major. And my question is, we talked a lot about transparency. What, and I was wondering, what, uh, what, what's in place right now that guarantees transparency in between Russia and the US? Um, and um, why would the burden fall largely on Russia if we were to implement more transparency? That's a good question. Um, so the current transparency regime allows us to count missiles and it allows us to count warheads. In fact, I, I had the extraordinary opportunity to go on several warhead counting inspections into Russia. So I, I'm one of the small handful of people can, that can say, I have been in a room this size with US nuclear warheads in the, in the room, because I went to the, the main maintenance facility at Kings Bay, Georgia for the nuclear submarines. And I have been in a room this size with Russian nuclear weapons. The Russians have to show us the nuclear weapons, but they're allowed to cover them with a shroud. So as not to disclose really sensitive national security information, their shape, how sharp their cones are, what the materials are, those kinds of things are very sensitive secrets. So the New START Treaty allows both sides to conduct 18 inspections a year. And we were doing that up until COVID hit. When COVID shut down our inspections of Russian weapon bases. So, but to go one step further, when, when, I, when I'm talking about the burden, it, if in a new arms control agreement, we would actually like to go into the production facility and see the weapons being made, count them, and then we'd like to see them being dismantled. And since Russia has such a vast, uh, a larger infrastructure for that, they would require more inspections to, to cover that. Anyways, this is beginning to be somewhat responsive to your question. Okay, yeah. Did, did you want to ask a question? Okay, Drew. Hi, yeah, Drew Horn, I'm an economics major. Thanks for your presentation. I was curious um, if you could talk about Russia's growing cyber capabilities and malign influence digitally. Um, and you know, put the 2018 NPR and sort of the the U.S. push to use nuclear weapons in terms of cyber attacks. How would that factor in the future arms negotiations? Yeah. Okay, that's a really good question. And up until about a year ago, I was able to easily sidestep that question by saying that has nothing to do with nuclear weapons. And then I could say next question. Uh, but I can't say that anymore because now in the 2018 NPR, the Trump administration, the NPR standing for Nuclear Posture Review, sorry about these acronyms, <laughs> I'm trying to sp spell them out when I just, uh, in the 2018 NPR, the Trump administration said that it re reserved the possibility of retaliating with nuclear weapons to a large scale cyber attack on US infrastructure. That was unusual. And it was, the language was a little subtle, but the message was clear. Also, not, not in the NPR, but in some documents that were prepared in preparation for the NPR, the, the Trump administration acknowledged that there was a danger of cyber attacks infiltrating the US Strategic Nuclear Command and Control System. And 
and disrupting or blocking the ability to actually send a launch code and get it verified. So now the, U the US military, this STRATCOM in particular, has stood up a cyber operations shop for protecting US strategic nuclear warheads and this associated infrastructure from a cyber attack. So that's now considered a viable threat, a real threat that we have to be prepared for. Yeah. Um, my name is Hiram, studying international relations. I was just wondering, uh, what do you think is Russians, Russia's motivation behind requesting um, that we get rid of the missile defense system? Uh, and what's kind of their fixation on that? So there are different schools of thought. on, uh, And the Russians have played this card the saying that that, it's, that our missile defense is a threat to their deterrence because it would defeat a retaliation on their part in a nuclear exchange. And that's a pretty logical argument. Um, I think there's other schools of thought, though, about what's motivating. Another school of thought is that it it plays into the hands of Russia's military industrial complex and their, their, uh, their intelligence community to make out the US as, as a fierce enemy. <clears throat> because that's how they justify their jobs and that's how they justify their bureaucracy. So I think there's a bureaucratic explanation for, for why the Russians. And, and then I think there's a third possibility, and that and it's the one that I tend to gravitate toward more personally, which is that the Russians are really concerned about our technological prowess, our ability to turn abstract concepts into hardware that actually can do advanced things. So the Russians are looking very nervously at our, our uh, electromagnetic railgun programs at our high energy lasers. Um, not many people know this, but the US is the one who invented the hypersonic glide vehicle 30 years ago. I remember getting a briefing on hypersonic glide vehicles more than 30 years ago. The US has been slow to develop that technology and the Russians have actually leaped ahead of us in, in some respects on that. So there's the deterrent stability argument, there's the internal bureaucratic politics argument, and then there's the technology being left behind by advances in technology arguments. And I think there's some element of all, all of those. But that is a really important question, and we need to, to better understand that. Thank you for asking that. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Jacob. I'm just wondering, uh, what is China's nuclear capability now that they're becoming more of a global powerhouse? And do they have any relations with Russia in terms of nuclear development or with us? So they, the Chinese got their first nuclear warhead designed from the Soviet Union in the 1950s. And the Soviet Union helped build their first infrastructure. Many of the some, let's not exaggerate it, but some of China's top nuclear weapon physicists and ballistic missile engineering scientists were educated in the United States and got PhDs at MIT mostly, um, but other universities. And then in, in one really famous case, the, the head of China's ballistic missile program got his PhD at MIT and then applied for a visa to stay here in the US and become a US citizen. And it was denied by the State Department. And they sent him back to China where he became the father of the Chinese nuclear program. So not too far sighted, I think, in the, in the whole visa process. But so China has, has uh, refused to be engage in an arms race with the US and has taken a slow, steady approach and currently has three to 400 warheads on a variety of platforms. The Chinese have never told us how many they have. And believe me, I have spent years talking to the Chinese in Beijing, in Shanghai, 
in Honolulu, we met once a year in Honolulu, and the, the Chinese are very circumspect when it comes to, to telling us numbers about their weapon systems. So, so there's a transparency problem there. But we figure they're in the three to 400 warhead range. It's maybe time to break for classes. Okay, one one final question. Well, more global. What did <coughs> Russia get out of this? I mean, because we debate in our country often right. how, what we get out of it. But we have we're a diverse economy with many interests around the world. We have a pretty simplistic economy. I can see why it'd be to their advantage the Middle East with shipping oil. But I, I don't see what they get out of it. So so the Russians get out of it prestige. Pow power, like influence, forum, you know, like they get membership on the National Security Council, they get veto power as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, yeah. they, they, get, they get this to stand with the US at, you know, in all the, in the global leadership hierarchy. So power, prestige, that's, so that's isn't that what we get then by them having nuclear weapons? I mean, we get them for speech because we respond to them. We sometimes validate that. Validate, yeah. 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 So, but that's really it. I think that's the short answer yeah. to what a question that deserves a much longer answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Join me once more. Thank you.